שבוע טוב, בוקר טוב. And, uh, okay, everyone has pages? Fine. Uh, before we begin uh, our show today, I would like to uh, dedicate five minutes uh, to what we have experienced uh, in the last uh, 48 hours. And uh, as, uh, as you all know, and there was the, the disaster, the stampede in, uh, in Miron with 45 uh, deaths. And that's uh, obviously that's a, that's a great tragedy. That's something that we, we should mourn. And uh, the state of Israel is declared today as a national mourning day, which I think is a, it's a proper thing to be done. And what we have in our tradition, in cases such disasters occur or happen, then uh, Rambam in the first chapter of Il Chotaniot says that it's a mitzvah de oraita uh, to pray and to, to be reminded of HaKadosh Baruch Hu when such events happen, and mainly that everyone should search his ways and to see how each one of us can take responsibility, how each one of us can improve and uh, take to heart what happened uh, in order to make, to make this world a better place and a safer place. So each one of us should, in his private sphere, uh, see how we can learn from, from such, a, such an event and also obviously as a, as a tzibur, as a, as, as a community, as a state, as a nation, we should take steps to, of course, to try and prevent such disasters from happening. And this should be taken both in the physical side, and that's less to our responsibility right now sitting here. No one of us is responsible for the police or for Iran. But uh, also in the spiritual side, each one of us can ask himself in his own behavior, right? When does we, when we are very focused on attaining our goals, when do we step on others? Which is, in the end, the lesson to be learned here. And that can be asked in, uh, from the Kiddushim here in Shabbat morning, uh, when there is a limited number of muffins, right? And, uh, and the stampede to reach the muffin. Uh, to what happens when we want to reach somewhere and there is a, a traffic light right, which is going, you know, which is blipping. The, the green is, uh, is blipping and do we slow down or do we uh, put our foot on the gas and, uh, and increase our speed in order to make it more or less in green or in yellow or in red. And each one of us would ask himself, so these are the, the, the occasions in each in which uh, each one of us as individual has to see how we, how we can improve. Uh, so that's a, I think that's, a, that's an important introduction to begin with. So we will dedicate this shiur to the Ilu Neshama of those that were, that were killed in the disaster and to the healing of those that were injured. So let's, uh, let's begin. We would like today to explore the approach uh, of the Nazib, Rabbi Naftali Tzvi Yudha Berlin, who was the Rosh Hashiva of Bolozhin in Lithuania in the beginning of the 20th century. So his approach toward Shemitah, which would be for us also, uh, we would, with that, we would finish our, that would be the final introduction to the subject of Shemitah and to what is the, level of Shemitah, the, the strictness of Shemitah that we should keep uh, in our days. We already had three shiurim about that, so I think that we are, uh, we are already deep into the subject. And I hope that in this shiur, in which we rep would present, is very sp special, unique, and I think very convincing, even if we do not accept all the, all its, all the details, but I think that he gives us both the spiritual structure and also the historical meaning to the keeping, to the observing of Shemitah in our days, which I think is important. So that's, uh, that's what we would want to speak about today. So we'll begin with his introduction to the question that he was asked. So that's an answer from, uh, let's begin to read, just, just begin to read in the first source. So he writes again, this, as we would see in a minute, it's in the beginning of the 20th century. So he says, 
in these years, קנו איזו משפחות שדות בארץ הקודש. So it says families begin to arrive and to buy fields and to establish יישובים and farms in the Holy Land, in ארץ הקודש. ונתעוררה השאלה, so the question has arose, מה יהיה משפטם בשנת תרמ"ט? Let's try to translate that. שנת תרמ"ט. So in order to help us, תרמ"ט is 1989. 1989 is תרמ"ט. So that is 100 years before, right? instead of תרמ"ט, תרמ"ט. So we're speaking about 1898. Now, if you have done your Israeli history, it's Aliyah Rishona. 1880, excuse me, yeah, 1889. Yeah, 1889, so that's Aliyah Rishona. So we speak about the establishment of Petah Tikva. That is more or less. And now people are beginning, up till then, 90, I don't have numbers, but most, most of the Jews were living either in Tzfat, in Tveria or in Yerushalayim, and they were, basically most of them would sit and learn Torah in Eretz Israel. People would come in old age in order to learn for a few years and then to be buried in Eretz Israel. That was more or less what was happening here. That was called the Yishuv HaYashan. But then in, in the Aliyah Rishona, that's the beginning of Zionism. Right, so that's Aliyah Rishona. Of the beginning of Zionism. Obviously, Zionism began with Avraham of Fin, right? But the modern day phenomena of Zionism, <coughs> excuse me, beginning there in the second half of the, eight, of the 18th, of the 19th, excuse me, of the 19th century. And the Nazis is being asked, so what are we going to do in the Shemitah? Right? So they ask uh, Rabbanim outside of Eretz Israel, the great, most of them were Olim, so they came from Europe, they knew the Rabbanim from Europe, and they asked them, what should we do as Shemitah approaches? We have to remember that people were extremely, I mean, it was difficult to be here. That's not, uh, they were not one of the 20 biggest economies back then. They didn't have, what's the, how do you say Talag in English? I have no idea. I, the, the, the productivity, the GDP, thank you. So they were not among the 20 best GDP producers. Back then, it was before even the British mandate, so we speak about the Turkish Empire uh, ruling. Now, it was not empire, <laughs> it was a failing state, and every, uh, much of it was corrupted. Life here was extremely, extremely difficult. And it was a very young establishment, and suddenly you tell them that for a whole year, they would have to abandon the land. That is going to be very, very hard. But on the other hand, the first founders uh, were, were religious. They were religious. They, what we call today orthodox. I mean, there was no orthodox. But nowadays, we'd call them orthodox. And that's also something that is very important to know. Right? The people that established, that founded the first Yishuvim, were religious, both near Yerushalayim, outside of Yerushalayim, also in Petah Tikva, they were religious people. So they were asking, they were asking uh, the Nazif, Rabbi Naftali Tzviud of Berlin, the head of the famous Bolozhin Yeshiva. So they were asking him, what should we do on Shnata Shemitah? And there were, it was not the only one that was asked. Obviously, there were other Rabbanim also that were, that were involved in the discussion. And he says, Vamikhtav Aiti Hamalitz. So there was a special, I mean, not a special, but there was a newspaper uh, that was uh, once a month, a monthly newspaper uh, that was published. And it, its name was The Militz. And people would publish their opinions and would send letters. And people, Rabbanim, certain Rabbanim were beginning to discuss that on the pages of The Militz. And you didn't, obviously, you didn't have internet blogs and you didn't have internet forums for Rabbanim to discuss. So they were discussing this. It was like a rabbinical newspaper, but not only Rabbanim. There were also other people that were printing there. And he says, had peace haterim me'ezo anashim. So some people, some Rabbanim, but not maybe the first tire. So they were beginning to publish 
some permissions to people build grounded in different approaches which we would explore with Zot Hashem in the forthcoming Shiurim. והנה המתיר הראשון כתב, כיוון דה שביעית בזמן הזה, הוא דה רבנן, so most of the Eterim were based on the grounds that Shmita in our times is only of a rabbinical authority. So that's ties obviously to what we spoke about, let's just have a very quick has, we spoke about three different reasons, each one of them stands by itself, why Shmita in our time would not be a Deoraita, although Shmita is written in the Torah. So you remember that the first reason is that it may be that the sanctification of the land uh, done by Ezra was uh, undone by the Roman conquest. So that was the first reasoning. But most of the Poskim believe that it is not the case. Meaning that the case is that even nowadays the land is still sanctified. The second reason that was discussed is that maybe because most of the Jewish people do not yet live on the land, then again, that's a reason why, that, why Shemitah would not apply nowadays, Midoraita. The third reason was that even if most of the Jewish nation would be on the land, yet it may stand to reason that in order to have Shemitah, we need to have the Yovel. In order to have the Yovel, the Jubilee year. Right? In order to have the Jubilee year, we need to know which lands belong to which family, right? What land belongs to which family? And because we do not, uh, we do not possess such knowledge, because we do not know how Yoshua Binun exactly divided the land, and we do not know each one of us, uh, except of the Kohanim, maybe, or the Levim, but they, they don't have lands to begin with. So, but the other tribes, we, we do not know, unless you surprise me, but we do not know what exactly tribe we came from, not exactly what family we came from. So we cannot know what is the share. I, I guess that if I would ask here, then you would not be able to tell me, you know, my family land is located in X. So because we are not able to say, even when we would have the majority of the Jewish people here, then we still won't have Shmita Midoraita. Now, each one of these, of these conditions is disputed, and I refer you back to our earlier shiur. I refer you back to our earlier shiur. But these were the, uh, the limitations that these Rabbanim were depending upon in order to print the Riterim. And, uh, and the Nazim did not agree with these Riterim. Now, he came from a very interesting point of view. He, his point of dispute was not if Shmita in our time is a Rabbanan or a Deoraita. I mean, he could have gone from this angle just to come up and say, you know, I think that all of these three points are incorrect, and that is why Shmita should be kept with Deoraita nowadays as well, and there is no room for leniency. Some Rabbanim, that was a position they took. Excuse me. But that was not a position taken by the Nazim. He believed that Shmita in our time is a very unique and, I think, uh, interesting mix of a Derabanan and a Deoraita. And I would dedicate this year, as we said, to the exploration of this uh, special uh, approach that the Nazim is, uh, is presenting to us. Now, in order to understand him, we need to understand the history of the first coming back to Zion, the first Shivat Tzion, as we call it, that happened in the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. So let me take you back in our time machine about 3,000 years ago. 3,000 years ago. So we return now to the time of, oh, a little bit, maybe I'm, I'm exaggerating, 2,500 years ago. 2,500 years ago to the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. Now, we all remember that the Babylon, right, the Bavlim, destroyed the first Beit HaMikdash and exiled the Jews from the land. That's the basic knowledge. And the Jews are being exiled. Most of them go to Bavel. They disperse throughout the whole land. The Yemenites claim that they are there from the time of the first Beit HaMikdash, the destruction of the first Beit HaMikdash. Also, the Ethiopians claim that they are there from the destruction, not only of the first Beit they claim that they are there from the exile of the 10 tribes. 
one, uh, 15, uh, 150 years before the destruction of the first temple. But basically, most of the Jews found themselves being exiled to Bavel, which became a center for Jewish life. As we know, even many, many years later, centuries later, the Talmud Bavli is being produced in Bavel because many, many Jews are there. So the Jews are there in Bavel, and they are not allowed to return to Eretz Israel, and certainly they are not allowed to reestablish their own state in Beit HaMikdash. But then comes along Koresh, and Koresh has, uh, it's unclear what he has. I mean, we can give different theories, we do not know. He may had some real spiritual inspiration. So he went to sleep and he had a dream at night and he decided that he would let the Jews come back to their land. That's how he described that. There is another theory which says that he decided when he became the king, he saw that there is going to be unrest in the empire because all of these exiles, the Jews were not the only one to be exiled. That was just a strategy of the Babylonians. That's, that's the way they, they exercised, exercised their power. So you saw that people are becoming uh, 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 aggravated. So he wanted to calm them down. So he let, let not only the Jews, but many other nations to go back to their ancestors' land and rebuild it. So that's another explanation. And the third explanation, a very interesting one, is that according at least to some of the Mefarshim, Koresh was the son of not other than Ahasuerus and Esther. And so it was under the influence of his own mother that he had let the Jews come back to their land. So it is very difficult to pinpoint what exactly caused him. But in the end, what we do know is that he had the following declaration. That's before the Balfour Declaration, we had the Koresh Declaration. So let's read the Koresh Declaration in source bit. Bishnat achat le Koresh melech para, so in the first year of Koresh, king of Persia, lichlot dvar Hashem mi pirmiya, as the 70 years that Irmiya promised had passed, he'ir Hashem et ruach Koresh melech para, so God had woken up the spirit of Koresh, the king of Persia, and Vayaver kol bechol malchuto vegam ben michtav leimo. So he had given a voice, he had sent a voice, sent a letter to all of his kingship, to all of his kingdom, in which it was said, Ko amar Koresh melech paras. So had said Koresh, king of Persia, kol mamlachot ha'aretz natan li Hashem elokei ha'shamayim, all the kings, all the, excuse me, the lands, the kingdoms, the kingdoms of land were given to me by Hashem God. It's a, a very interesting declaration from the king of Persia. And he commanded me to build for him a house in Yerushalayim in Judea. Okay, so again, was that a sincere, authentic vision that he had? Was it a, politi a political calculation? Was it under the influence of his mother? We do not know. But truth is, we do not really care. Right? What we do care is that finally we are being given the permission to go back to our land and to build Beit HaMikdash. Wonderful, beautiful. Me, and Koresh says, Mi bachem mi kol amo, whoever wants from the Jewish people, yehi Hashem elokav imo, God should be, may the force, right? may God would be with you. And you can go to Yerushalayim in Judea, even in Beit Hashem Elokei Israel, who Elokei Hashem Yerushalayim, and you may build the temple, the house of God in Yerushalayim. Now, to what extent did the Jews uh, heed to this declaration? So, more or less, the same amount that went in the first two or three aliyot. Meaning to say, almost no one. Almost no one. That's, that's what happened. That's what happened in our time. So that's just what is happening. Well, after people had settled down in, it doesn't matter if in Bavel or in Europe or in wherever they had been, it was just 
I mean, it was, uh, I wouldn't say that they were extremely the, the richest people on earth, or that they were, that there was no anti-Semitism. There was what there was, but they were set down. When one knows his own troubles, he doesn't necessarily be very keen to switch them with another package of troubles, right? So each one of us has his own, as we say, pekalach. And, and, you know, my pekalach is my pekalach, and your pekalach is your pekalach. If I'm now in Babel, and I live my own life, I live my own life. So come Koresh, and he suddenly is a very Zionist guy, and he helps me to go to Israel. Fine, thank you. I am fine right here. It's interesting that it's mirrored in our son. Exactly the same thing. Up to, exactly. Ve'ele b'nei ha'medina. So how many people in the end came to Eretz Yisrael, so if you count the whole number of people, children, women, men, everyone, so we speak about Arba Ribo Alpaim Shloshmiot Veshishim. So it's 42,360. That's a very puny number. I mean, I don't know how many Koresh envisioned. So I'm, I don't know what were the visions of Koresh. But if I would ask Yechezkel or Yeshayahu, what do you hope that would happen when God would give the permission to the Jews that were expelled and exiled from the land, and they see it and they cry, right? Al neharot bavel sham yashav nugam bachinu. On the readers of Babylon, we are sitting and crying. Okay, so you are crying. Now you are being given the permission to go back. Oh no, we are fine crying in Bavin. Right? That's uh, now I am not in a position to criticize anyone. I was born here. Everyone sitting here around this table did the act and made Aliyah. So I am the least one sitting here that is able to criticize anyone. But uh, but that's just life. Right? That's just life. And you know people that remain in wherever they are and Wait for uh, who knows what. Right? The permission is there. Just take your things and, 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 and come. It's not so simple. It's not so simple. Yeah, it's very difficult to say, but it, it was at least hundreds of thousands. At least. At least. At least. We know by the number of the deaths of the, of the, ki- the, the people that were killed. So it, it, it is counted in the millions. So it must be on the, when the first exile. So it must be that there were also at least hundreds of thousands or maybe millions that were exiled. So these are very large numbers. These are. Well, as you said, that the Eretz Israel has Kedusha again. Is that like a, a marketing point to get these? <laughs> no, it was a halachic point. It, it was a halachic <laughs> point. That's right. So we said, but it. It's a very big and good question, which I, I am not able I don't go into details about. But this condition that most of the people should be on the land, is it a condition in the Kedusha? As, as you present, then Ezra would be in a very big problem to enact the sanctification of the land. Or are these two separate conditions? Maybe you can sanctify the land even without the majority of the people on the land. But certain halachot would still not apply. So that's a very good question, which right now we, I, I, I cannot go with. It was part of the debate about the Natsib Shita. But let's imagine, for the time being, let's accept the assumption that the sanctification by itself, the Kedusha by itself, cannot be, that can be enacted even without the majority of the people. But it's an additional condition. That's a, that would be our assumption right now. So we speak about 41,000, that's more or less as the two first aliyot combined. So the, the first aliyah, I mean, now in our old times. These are basically the numbers. So it's very interesting how seemingly the, the situation is. Now, you would think maybe that the people that would come to Earth Israel would be the most religious people, or the most observant people, that they are the ones that want to experience the Kedusha. But you would be surprised to know, or not surprised to know, that just as in the modern times, also in Ezra times, the people that came to the land were not necessarily 
were not necessarily the most observant people. The people that came to Eretz Israel were either the people that suffered the greatest suffering in Babel, so they had no, I mean, they, for them it was a way of maybe trying to reinvent themselves. So these people were, so we can maybe equate that to people that were under the pogroms, right, in Russia, in other places, it was clear they had to fly away, they flew, flee away. The question was only where to flee. So it would be either to America, that was obviously one major destination in, in, in our times, or a very small percentage, percentage make its way to Eretz Israel. So that's more or less would be uh, the equation here. Uh, it, so basically these were the people and the few people that were very, very, uh, that had very strong ideology and the religious commitment that also made the way, such as Ezra himself and Nehemiah. So they come to Eretz Israel, they begin to settle the land. It's going very, very great difficulties. Why? Because after the exiles, as you know, there is no vacuum. So other nations began to take position in, to take, to take possession of the land of Eretz Israel. Also, the Bavlin, the Babylonians themselves, just as they exiled the Jews to somewhere in, in Bavel, they took the people that were the inhabitants of these lands in Bavel and took them to, to the land of Israel. That, that was their plan, just to switch populations so people would feel uncomfortable in their land and they would not rebel. That was the whole strategy behind the actions. So, uh, we returned here, and if we would have returned in great numbers, then there would be no question. But we returned in small numbers. And because we returned in small numbers, then the Kutim and some Arabs, by the way, that already were taking roots here, so they were blocking the way, the path, for the Jews to rebuild the state. Although the Jews had the permission from the king of Persia. So they were supposed to be given everything they needed in order to build their national homeland. Nonetheless, the people that were already here were not happy with that. So they were, you we say, they were terrorizing the Jews that, that came in. So you see that history is really, play, it's very interesting. It's very, very interesting to read uh, the history of the first coming back to Zion with uh, looking from the Paris of our own days, the second, you may say, returning to Zion. So, uh, be it as it may, that were going on for about 30 years, and the Jews, well, they began to build the second temple, they laid the foundations, they were not really able to complete it, they were not able to build the Yerushalayim walls, so everything was very, very, going very rough for them. And then came Nehemiah. Now, Nehemiah was a minister, a very high minister in the Persian government. Koresh was, was already gone, and now we have the king Archa Shtastra. Okay? So Nehemiah is a very high minister in his government. And uh, now, let's read from source Gimel. Divrei Nechemia ben Chachalia. So this is the words of Nechemia, son of Chachalia. Vayayi bechodesh kislev, shnat esrim, vani ayiti beshushan abira. So uh, he says, I'm in Shushan. Why? Because I'm, I'm a minister in the government. I'm an official. Vayavo Hanani. So some, a guy named Hanani. Echad meacha is one of my brothers. It doesn't mean one, uh, a sibling. A brother means one of the Jews. And Nehemiah asked them, what's going on in Jerusalem? How things are, I mean, there is no internet, right? There is no TV, there is no radio. So he doesn't know what's going on there. There is a very deepening uh, trouble in Yerushalayim. Uh, the, the situation is shameful. The walls are broken. So everyone can come in, can come out. There's no security. 
ושעריה ניצתו באש, the gates are burned down. ויהי כשומעי את הדברים האלה, ישבתי ואבכס, או נחם יסד, when I heard these words, I sat down and I cried. He imagined, I guess, that people were able to build something there. He says, no, the situation was uh, very, very bad. ואת הבלה ימים, ויהי צם, I fasted, I mourned, הוא מתפלל לפני אלוקי השמיים. And then, now there is a long, long tefillah, which I skipped. And then, after that tefillah, he doesn't, that's what makes him stand apart from the others. He doesn't only daven, after davening, he says, okay, now what can we do? So, you don't, it's not enough just to pray to God to make you win the lottery. You need to go and buy the ticket. So, it's not enough to say to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please rebuild the Jewish home. That's very fine. But, If you want, let give him the pipe, right, in which the blessing can come through. So it's, uh, after davening, he goes to the king, to the Persian king. Now that this uh, formulation may remind you of something, right? That is, of course, how Esther approaches Achashvero. So we see here, that he's trying to hint to something. Right? So, Ima lamelech tov, v'im yitav avdecha lefanecha, and if I'm a good servant to you, asher tishlacheni el Yehuda, el ir kivrot avotai ve'evnena. He's being, he's asking not to go as a private individual, but he says, please give me the official role. Let me be your uh, ambassador to Judea, but he's not only an ambassador, you understand it. If the land is under the, rush, the kingship of Persia, then if he's the ambassador to there, then he is like, uh, what would be the name? Go, a governor. Yeah, more of a governor. Thank you. Like Herbert Samuel. If you, again, if you go back to Jewish history, then he is the Herbert Samuel of the day. He was the first uh, governor that was sent by the British government. So uh, he asked the king, and the king agrees. And the king gives him, but the king says, I, I need you here, so I would only send you for a limited uh, number of years. Be it as it may. Nehemiah goes, and again, I would have loved to learn now some of the chapters that describe how Nehemiah comes here, and he's, he, has a whole, he does a whole journey through the land in order to see to himself, and he describes how everything is destroyed, and there are burned stones everywhere. Because the Jews were not able to rebuild. The, the numbers were too small and they were too poor. They couldn't afford rebuilding the state. They needed charity from Chutzla. Uh, so again, you can, uh, you, can draw, you can draw the lines to our situation. Now, what we, we are now first forwarding, again, I, unfortunately, we don't learn here, except for Nehemiah, maybe in some other day. But right now, we do not learn Sefer Nehemiah. So I'm first forwarding, I'm skipping uh, a few chapters. And I am now in Rosh Hashanah in Yerushalayim. Nehemiah rebuilt the city walls, and he was fighting back. He was giving back to the Arabs and to the Kutim, drove them away. And he was able to reestablish a little more secured foothold in Yerushalayim, a Jewish foothold. And now in Rosh Hashanah, after he was able to secure their, their, their survival, now he's beginning to ask himself, okay, physical survival we have, what about, what about spirituality? Because the situation in Eretz Israel is very, very bad. The spiritual leadership, the Rabbanim, most of the Kohanim, remained in Bavel. Remained in Bavel. And in Bavel, you had halacha, you had Jewish life, everything was beautiful, you had Jewish schools, I guess. But in Eretz Israel, they were extremely poor, and there was poverty everywhere, and there was, and, and people were, were just going on with whatever they had. So halacha, keeping halacha observance was very, very small, very, very low. People were marrying outside of faith. So they were uh, what we call Nisweit Bolelut. Right? So they, we had, uh, we had uh, very uh, difficult problems 
that Nehemiah had to face. And he decided, he chose that he would face them on Rosh Hashanah. So on Rosh Hashanah, everyone is coming to Yerushalayim, and there is nothing there about Kiyat Shofar, so I don't know why, uh, but there is no description of Kiyat Shofar. What there is there is Kiyat Torah. He reads from the Torah, and to many people, that's the first time they hear the Kiyat Torah. It may be that Ezra just then institutionalized the translation to Aramaic. Most of them were not even Hebrew speakers. So they needed to hear in Aramaic. And they come to Yerushalayim and they hear the mitzvot and finally, suddenly they understand that they are very far away from, from being uh, faithful Jews. And they begin to cry. And then he tell them, you know, it's Rosh Hashanah. You need to be happy. We'll work on that. But you need to make a commitment. And they make the commitment. And that's a, a very exciting and moving, uh, I, I guess, uh, um, stand uh, that was there. And again, we don't have any time to read. If you want, then later you read from the, uh, just Nehemiah Perikhetet, you have the, the Sukim here. And he tells them, you need, if you are married to non-Jewish uh, women, uh, then you need either to convert them or to, to separate, or to separate. You cannot stay. <laughs> uh, and you need to learn him. <laughs> he, he, he tells them a few very interesting and important things. And then, and he speaks about the Shabbat, because people are not keeping the Shabbat. You need to keep the Shabbat. You need to stop walking on Shabbat. You need to stop. Shabbat was the market day. You need to stop buying and selling on Shabbat. And then he says to them, look at this first pass, the last, excuse me, the last pasuk in source Dalet. So it's part of the covenant that he makes with them. So the people of the land, being the Kutim, the Arabs, they make Shabbat their market day, and they, they bring the, all the products on Shabbat. We would not buy from them. We would not sell to them. Shabbat Uveyom Kodesh. And then he says, Venito Sheta Shana Shvit Umasa Koliad. So on the seventh year, we would abandon the land. Meaning to say, we would not walk the land. So you see here that Shmita was part of the covenant. So part of the few selected mitzvot that Ezra found is found in the foundational. Found foundational to the to the covenant, to the re-signing of the covenant between the Jewish people and Akadosh Baruch. So it's on the first line, the first row, with marriage, with worshiping God in Beit Hamikdash, with Shabbat, there is Shemitah. So Shemitah is not seen as some you know, five degree, some fifth degree mitzvah which you will come to one day. Ezra thinks that Shemitah should be... Now, regardless right now of the question, is it a Deoraita or a Derabana? Because as we saw, most of the Jews obviously did not come with Ezra. But Nehemiah and Ezra are working here together see the mitzvah of Shemitah as crucial in resettling the land. Now, if you think that Shemitah is a Deoraita nowadays and then, then it's clear why Ezra makes such a fuss about Shemitah. But if you hold, as the majority opinion of the post, the Shemitah in, the, in our times, so also in Ezra times, was not a Deoraita. Why Ezra is making Shemitah such an important mitzvah as one of the only five or six mitzvot he mentions as the core of the resettling of the land. Obviously, he sees it as uh, maybe a derabanan, but a mitzvah that does not only reflect our situation as it is, but also the situation as we aspire it to be. So Shemitah is not only a problem 
that we need to somehow pass by or live through. Shemitah for Ezra is the very realization of the vision, of the dream of coming back to the land. What is the point? If you'd ask Ezra, I'm sure that's what would answer you. What is the point of coming back to the land of Israel if you are not going to observe the mitzvot that are unique to the land of Israel? So even if from the Torah, for some reason, we are not obligated right now, as I would tell you, as I would tell you back then, and as I would tell you just now, even if we are, we are not obligated from the Oraita, nonetheless, it's an extremely important mitzvah because what are we trying to establish here? Is a kingdom uh, of Kohanim and the holy nation, Mamlechet Kohanim Vegoi Kadosh. So we need to show, if we want to demonstrate to Akadosh Baruch Hu, that that is where we are heading. If we come back here and you say to Akadosh Baruch Hu, you know, we are coming back here, but we suspend the special mitzvot that you gave the land, what face do we have? We need to put our resources into realizing what we speak about. You cannot profess and speak and, and, and teach about the holiness of the land and why it is so important to come here and then ask HaKadosh Baruch to help you in reestablishing the Jewish homeland and then just behave like it is Babel or like it is United States or like it is England. It's not. It's Eretz Israel. That's, that's the whole point why I'm here. The Matsif says we have to understand that. And then he gives a very interesting definition here in source A, again, I will not read it uh, because the language is, uh, is rabbinical, somewhat of pack language, but I would say it in my own words. And again, if someone wants to be more uh, 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 concise and, and uh, exact, then you are more than welcome to read either my expert here in source A or just to go back to the original truth, which is extremely long, and, and read the whole thing for yourself. Uh, but but I, I, would say, I would say it in a very, maybe again, not, not extremely, uh, exact, but uh, that is the, the spirit of the things. He says, you know, it may be that the obligation of Shemitah nowadays is the Rabbanan. But even if the obligation is the Rabbanan, the value is a Deoraita. When we observe the Shemitah, we achieve a goal which is a Deoraita goal. Even if right now the obligation is only the Rabban. I, I hope it makes sense, this distinction between the level of obligation on the one hand, but the level of goal that we are trying to achieve. I will give you, a, 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 I think, a simple example to that. You know that davening, praying, three tefillot a day is obviously the Rabban. There is a dispute regarding one mitzvah a day. If it's the right or the rabban, but three minutes, three fillot a day is obviously the rabban. Fine, but we all understand that speaking to God, asking God for help, praising a kadosh baruch Hu, even if it's not obligatory from the Torah to do it three times a day, obviously the Torah is happy right, with us doing it three times a day. So it's not an obligation, but it's a fulfillment of a right event. Says the Nazim, that is how we should approach Shemitah nowadays. He says, in our days, that's, I, I, that's why I find it so convincing. Not only because, you know, in the Gemara, you can just debate either here or there, and, and, you know, there is some merit and some difficulty with any one of the positions. But what I find so convincing in the Nazim's approach is that he is having a very strong historical background and spiritual meaning to the way, to the approach he has for Shemitah. He says, Shemitah, Shemitah's obligation may only be the Rabbana. He, he tried also to argue that even the obligation is the right, because when Ezra made the covenant, then the covenant is binding as a nether. So we as a nation took a vow, and, and the vow, a nether, is obligating us the right. So we are not obligated to keep Shemitah because of the mitzvah of Shemitah, but we are obligated to keep Shemitah because of Ezra's vows, Ezra Neder. So that's, that's another step. That's another step, which is disputed by other Rabbanim. But if we ignore for a minute this step, if we speak only about the mitzvah of Shemitah, 
I found his presentation, his, his, uh, his uh, attitude very refreshing and very accurate in speaking to our historical and spiritual position and situation just nowadays. It says it may be that the obligation is only the Rapan, but we have to understand that that's not a, a regular the Rapan. So what do I mean by saying regular the Rapan? So for example, Chachamim told us that we should not eat chicken in milk, right? Why? Because chicken and cow, in the end, both of our meat, and it's very easy to get confused. So if we would eat chicken in milk, in the end, we would find ourselves eating cow in milk. So sometimes you need to take precautions. We can, I think we can all understand that, right? Why precautions? I think we had a whole year to learn why precautions are, are important. So we can easily understand that. But in the end, the whole value of not eating chicken in milk is only in order to better keep, not to eat meat with uh, cow meat or, or, or basar bakar, right, with, with meat. Fine. But when we speak about Shemitah is the Rabban, it's not only let's keep Shemitah now in the Rabban, and so one day when the Jewish nation would sit on its, on, 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 on its land, we would be able to remember what is Shemitah the Oraita. No. There is a value to Shemitah nowadays. Because Shemitah is part of how HaKadosh Baruch Hu wants us to conduct ourselves in this land. It's part of the special covenant we have with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That's what is clearly being said. I think the Nazi here is a very strong proof. Clearly being said in Sefer Ezra, in Sefer Nehemiah. And that's why, says the Nazif, you cannot take Shemitah and put leniencies because you say, you know, it's in the Rabbanan, and in, in Mitzvah the Rabbanan, we have leniencies in places of big lasses, monetary lasses. So sometimes you have leniencies in Mitzvah the Rabbanan. Says the Nazif, it's an obligation, the Rabbanan, but the Mitzvah is a Deoraita Mitzvah. We cannot use these leniencies. Now, again, we will have to come and see what in, in the end, what ministries would be used and what not. But as an, a, what should be our basic approach? I believe, again, I, I great Rabbanim here are in dispute and I'm a, I need to know my place. I'm a shul rabbi, right? I'm not, I'm not in line with the people that we quote here. But if you ask me, Right, what, where I, I the, the small and the young, find myself in line with, aligned to, then this approach, I think, is extremely convincing. It's extremely convincing. It describes, it takes a precedent, what happened with Ezra, which is extremely similar to the position in Taf Reish Mem Tet, I think, in 1889, but also to 2021, or maybe 2022. Which, we, which would be a year of Shemitah. Our situation, Baruch Hashem, we are in a much better say, stage in terms of security, in terms of our financial ability. But in terms of our Geulah, that's exactly the stage where we are. We secured our physical survival, more or less, or we still need to, to have an army, we still need to protect ourselves, but we now should and must turn our, our, our attention to our spiritual side. After securing our physical survival, after Baruch Hashem, we have it, uh, uh, again, under the conditions of Corona right now, but we have a, a good and secure economy. These things should still be kept, should still be attained to, but we need to begin to focus on why are we here? We are not here to have the, the, the greatest army, or to have the best economy. All of these are good things to have. But these are, just as we are not here to have two hands and two legs, we need them, but that's not the cause of our existence. The cause of our existence is our spiritual being here. And that should, uh, that should be a reason for us, I think. That should be a motivation for us to return to the covenant of Ezra, to look at the myths what he speaks there about speaks there about, uh, obviously, about marrying 
within the Jewish people, obviously. He speaks there about the Shabbat. He speaks there about the Shemitah. He speaks there about justice. These are the things that we should right now attend to. And it's a great merit for us that we are able to attend to the things. But on the other hand, it's a great responsibility. And uh, the Torah says, we'll finish with that. The Torah says that the Shemitah, not keeping the Shemitah, the, the last source, in Vaikal Kafav, uh, that's from uh, uh, Behar. So that, that would be what we'd read, right? That's, that's uh, our, our coming parsha. Vashimoti ani et aretz, vashamemu aleha oivechem ayoshvim ba. So says God, I would, if you'd, if you'd sin against me, I would dispose you of the land, and the land would become desolate. Ve'etchem ezre bagoim. So you'd be expelled to among the nations. And there would be swords running after you. And your land would be desolated. Again, and your cities would be destroyed. And you know why would that be? Because you, we, didn't keep the Shemitah. So God is expelling us from the land. And then the land would get the rest it deserves. That's obviously a mashal. The land itself doesn't need the rest but it's a marshal for us. So God says, you know, you are here for a reason. If you do not keep the covenant, then putting feeling that you can also do in Kutzalat. We are here to exercise a certain social, we may say, and holy social construction. Shemitah is a big part of it. And we need to begin working on it. We want, we don't, obviously we do not want Shemitah to be happening when we would be in exile. We had that for 2,000 years. Our return here is not, not, not in order to bypass Shemitah, to skip Shemitah, to dive into HaKadosh Mohu that some of the seventh year would never come. We are in a special and unique position to try and observe Shemitah. Now again, how can it can be done? There are many, many difficulties and we should see to it, that we are observing Shemitah in a way that is not damaging the farmers, that is not damaging uh, Israeli exports. So there, there are different goals and challenges that we need to face. But nonetheless, uh, I think it's imperative for us to learn about this topic. So that's why I'm happy that we have chosen this topic. I myself very uh, thrilled and excited about preparing ourselves in a meaningful way. So Shemitah would not only be us searching on the Kashrut uh, 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 tag, saying that, don't worry, there's no Shemitah. Because we do not wo- want to not be worried about not being Shemitah. We want to be worried <laughs> or to be observing the Shemitah laws as we should observe them in the supermarket, in our own gardens, everywhere that we walk. So that's what we are going to speak about in Mirza Hashem from next week, about the halachot of Shemitah. And we would begin, Bezat Hashem, uh, from speaking about the laws of our own gardens before coming to consumer to a lot of consumers. And the reason is because some of the laws of our own gardens we need to begin to take care of from now. People that have gardens, we need to make some preparations. So we want to begin to speak about that. So that would be from Bezat Hashem from next week. And I hope that next week we would be in a day of, of national happiness and not Chasu Khalila in national mourning. Have a, have a good week and Besmachot. It's interesting to see the, the, the idea of Shemitah of the new connection with the land. You mentioned the, the previous stuff, the people, even in uh, current times, 